right. Hello, everybody. Thanks again. Um, I hope you enjoyed that uh, music over lunch. That's just fantastic. I love listening to James. He makes me laugh. Okay, so this next session is about sort of the history and the future of iOS user interfaces. There's all sorts of cool things going on right now, people experimenting with new approaches, people thinking about different ways to interact with content. And uh, what we're going to hear about in the next hour is about how people are doing that and how to move forward with that. So without further ado, here's Chai. Hello. So I get to talk to you today a bit about instead of moderating the session and um, I'm going to chat right after lunch on um, iOS user experience and what are the trends for 2013. And I want to thank um, Tim and Bill for letting us help um, organize this conference. It's been a really great experience. Um, so I'm Chai, and I'm the CEO of Cubop. And you can find me on Twitter. It's um, at C-H-I-A-H. -H. And um, I'm, I'm pretty responsive, so feel free to tweet at me. Um, so our company, Cubop, it has over 10 years of mobile experience. You might have seen Evan. Um, moderating as well. He's actually my co-founder. And um, we've shipped apps for old carrier decks, iOS, Android, Nook, Kindle, and Windows Phone. And we've been featured in the App Store um, in the US, Canada, and, ja and Japan. We've also had some really large enterprise clients like GE and Micros. Um, they make point of sale systems for people like Starbucks and um, TGI Fridays. So, why, why are we talking about this? Um, because we spend a lot of time looking at UI so we can help our clients design apps. And we found that we have spent more time sometimes designing the actual app than actually programming it. And one of the things that we noticed is that there's, a, there's been a big change in what apps look like. So in 2007, the tab bar was the thing. That was how you were going to do top level navigation. You just have this tab bar at the bottom and it took up some space. In 2011, everybody was pulled over by the icon grid. I don't know if you remember that, but everyone's like, yes, the icon grid is the thing in early 2011. Everybody thought, yes, every app is going to have an icon grid. It's great. And then by the end of 2011, everybody said, no, 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 no. That was a bad idea. We're moving beyond that. And in 2012, we moved to the hidden side menu. So, you know, now the standard tab bars are seen as somewhat old-fashioned. You can see that with these eight apps. They're, they're just a few examples like the YouTube app, of course, Facebook, Path, National Parks app, Yahoo, Lemon. Um, you can see that there's a lot of them. There's also a dark side to this hidden navigation. So your app looks really, really simple until you open up that side menu. So this has just started to happen. We've noticed this. The latest version of Path, you see, we have this wonderful slide menu, and it slides over. And then if you see at the top with a little photo, it's a sideways sliding panel of like people you might know. And then after that, you could go, oh, I could promote my path. And this transparent overlay comes up from the bottom. It says, hey, do this. Um, there's some sideways drill downs. There's secondary navigation. It's, it's gotten a little bit crazy. You see this with the National Parks app as well. There's sideways sliding, there's some main navigation, there's drill down. So we, we kind of want to caution to be a little more careful with these hidden navigations. So we've also seen that there's other primary navigation that, that's come up. Um, we've kind of gone beyond the slide sliding menu um, in some cases. So clear is a good example. They have some gestures. They're like, hey, so what if instead of navigating by having a tab or by having a menu, we have something that you gesture, you pull down to create an item, you pinch to navigate, and you edge swipe to list. Another one is Evernote. So Evernote put a lot of thought into their navigation, and they said, well, what if it kind of looked more like a notebook or those old file folders? I don't know if you remember back in the day, we had to file A to Z. So they're like, oh, well, we'll do that. And then they put the action buttons at the top. So they've done some, some things to make it look different. They're like, yeah, we're not going to do what everybody else is doing. Um, another um, interesting thing is pull to refresh. It used to be a non-Apple convention. And you can see this with Twitter, Boxcar, Messenger, Seismic. And a lot of people said, well, you know, when I look at my mail app, 
Why can't I do the same? So finally, they, they, they did put it in last year, and it, it came into mail with iOS 6. So other trends that we've seen. There's a trend towards flatness and minimalism. So with all the social apps in 2011, every single one of them had five tabs at the bottom. And the middle button answered, what do I do with this app? And it was a very big, prominent button. You could see that with Instagram and Pinterest. So you could see that it was a, it was a bigger button, and there's, there's definitely an emphasis for that button. And you could see, as of last year, they kind of moved towards this more flat look. And it's gone back towards, OK, we're not going to overly emphasize that button. So the interesting one in this space is Foursquare. So you can see in for with Foursquare in 2010, they had their check-in button up at the top right. They had the tab bars, at the, the tab buttons at the bottom, but it didn't really have the same look as, let's say, the um, Instagram app. And once Instagram got really popular, they're like, oh, so we need to answer the question, what is this app for? We'll move the, the button to the middle, like all the other social apps. And then in 2012, they made some changes, they thought about what their business model was, and they said, well, we really want to de-emphasize the check-in and emphasize explore. So they went to a three-button tab bar and put explore in the middle. They also made this interesting change that I'm not sure um, if I like. Uh, it's this change of more minimal information on the screen. I think that the middle one is actually a lot more useful because you can see a lot more of what's going on with your friends, who's there, and I, I think that we have to be careful when we go minimal and um, in, in our apps. So again, we're, we're eliminating this whole idea of gradients, 3D elements, and skeuomorphism in, in a lot of the current apps that are coming out, the current batch of popular apps. So you can see Twitterific, very, very, very little in terms of gradients and um, skeuomorphism. Google Plus, Letterpress, Figure. And also notice how all of the squares are now 90 degrees. They're not rounded squares. They don't have a nice little one pixel drop shadow behind them. They're, they're really pretty much like flat, and there you are with this, um, this kind of flat look. So some of the things that we've noticed as well is that UI design has become a little more like print. It looks, it looks a little more like a magazine it used to look like. Um, you can see that with Flipboard, I think they were pretty much the, the app that came out with this first. They were like, oh, it's kind of like print, and you could see what, um, what, what, what they took from what a magazine, a shiny magazine, would look like. And a lot of other apps have been copying that, like the LinkedIn app looks very, very similar. And if you look at a lot of the apps out there, they're, they're kind of getting towards that print style look. Um, it also seems like we're taking design influences from Windows Metro and Android 4.2. You know, again, with the very square looking corners and the flat look and very little in, the term, in terms of draft shadows. So it, it, this is just kind of an interesting side note. We saw that someone made an app, an iOS app, in the Windows Metro style to play music on an iOS device. So it's kind of an interesting um, view in where designers think that the design of apps on iOS is going. But Apple definitely resists this. So you can see um, Google Maps on the right that there's very much a square kind of look, but Apple Maps still has the, the signs that look like highway signs. It's still very skeuomorphic. And of course, you know, find my friends. It's it's, it's the app that everybody points to, like, oh, it has that stitching. It's, it's, it looks like something that's stitched in leather. So another trend for this year is gestures. 
So gesture-based apps um, rely a lot on tutorials and documentation. And one of the things that we tell our clients is if you have to sit through a four or five page explanation of what to do in an app before you have any point of reference for what you're going to use the app for, it's actually really difficult because you won't remember. I mean, I've had apps that I've said, okay, I really want to use this. I really, I think it's going to make my life better. It's going to be very useful. And then they, they, they go, okay, now you have to sit through this, you know, five screen thing where we explain to you, okay, so if you pull down, this happens. If you like swipe up, if you pinch, uh, and, and even though I want to remember it, I don't remember. I don't know if you found that to be true in your own lives, but if you have no point of reference for what you're going to use the app for and how it fits into your life, you're not going to remember this wonderful screen of, you know, remember, you can swipe to the side to do this, and you can pull down to do this other thing. So as much as possible, really try to think about your user when you're designing the app, that they can think of this as a, as a, as a thing that is um, instinctive and you don't have to have this huge amount of explanation. But it is, it is a trend, and people are slowly becoming trained in it, so still think about, okay, how can we use gestures? Have they been trained by, by another popular app? I mean, one example is Facebook. If something is being done by the Facebook app, you can kind of say, well, a lot of people probably know about it. But one prime example of that is the side swiping hidden menu that became really popular after Facebook put it into their app because everybody that I know who has an iOS device has the Facebook app. So you know they've at least seen it before and it's like, okay, so if Facebook put it, puts a gesture in, I would, I would say, you know, consider whether or not it would work in your app. But again, just, just remember, this, this is very hard for a user to get, especially if you're trying to put novel gestures into your app. Um, custom graphical and animated UI. Um, our favorite example of this is Path. It's very cute. I mean, almost a little precious sometimes because if you press the little plus button to get all of the nice um, buttons that tell you what your options are for posting something on Path, it kind of comes out in this sort of bouncy animated wave and you get your buttons and you could put in a picture or you could um, share your location, you could tell, them, tell it you're sleeping, and the plus goes to an X, so it's like, oh, now I'm the thing that you use to close this little option. So it's, it's nice to have this kind of custom UI because you can use this cross-platform. You can use this on Android, it still works. It's not, it's not UI that's tied to a particular platform. So that's something to think about. I know it's, it's a little more work sometimes to put in custom UI, but if you're doing anything that goes cross-platform, your own app or a client app, you're, you're probably going to have to think about this. And, you know, th this is the plus for doing custom UI. And, again, custom UI for um, data visualization. Dark Sky is a great app. Um, I don't know if you guys use it. It'll tell you if it's going to rain in the next hour using publicly available data. So what they did is they put a nice little presentation layer on it so you could see, oh, is it going to rain where I am using GPS for in the next hour? And it has a nice little slidey bit that you could slide and it tells you where, when it will rain, it tells you where you are, and um, it has a nice um, radar sort of looking map that you can look at. So. You know, how do you represent a lot of data on a small screen is something to think hard about if you are doing something like that. And try to do it graphically. Because it's really hard for a user to parse a giant table of numbers. I mean, this is coming in a as data that doesn't look anything like this. So if you're kind of going, well, okay, you as the user have to figure this out with this giant table of information, no one can, can figure that out, but if you can give them a nice map and give them a nice little graph, users will go, oh, okay, I get this. I understand how this works. Um, there's, there's reinvention of standard UI elements. So um, Terrific is a great example of this. You see that they said, well, you know what? We don't, we're not going to use the Apple settings for, for changing settings. We're going to write our own. It's very pretty. It looks like it fits in with the rest of their app. And that's a, that's a nice touch, and it's it's a it's something that you know users do notice, and it's 
it's a good thing to do if you can afford that time. Um, so I know I said that there's a lot of apps going towards this flat, very, um, very much that metro style, but there's also other apps that are going very much in the skeuomorphic way, like paper. You see they have really nice little pictures of all the different pens. There's books. There's this beautiful texture on the paper. And it has won a lot of awards, um, and Apple has featured it. So I think that um, the thing that I want to bring up is that in the future, apps will kind of go in two different directions. There's going to be the apps that are very much in that minimalistic style, and then there are other apps that are going to say, no, no, we're going to go really, really in the pretty skeuomorphic way. And I don't think there's going to be a lot in between anymore. It's going to go kind of in two directions. Um, another thing for people to um, remember, and we tell our clients this a lot, is that mobile UI changes. The trends change very quickly. We've noticed that about every six months, there's a new big trend that comes out. And we encourage people to go back and look at apps that have been released, especially if you want to keep it up, and say, OK, is this looking really dated? So every three to six months, go back to your apps and say, OK, is this, is this looking like something that was written ages ago you know, in, in mobile time? You know, a, a year ago is like, oh my gosh, that was like back in the Paleolithic ages. And, and think about how you can take some of the new trends and move them into your app. You don't have to do an, a giant redesign of everything, but at least think about, OK, Am I making some decisions that, that move this app into, you don't have to be on the bleeding edge, but at least be in the middle of the pack for, for where apps are. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people in this room who are going to drive the next trend. So I'm very excited to see what will happen. And thank you very much. Awesome. OK, so there was a clock sitting right in front of my nose, and I couldn't read any of them. So good afternoon, and thank you guys for standing in front of me and uh, letting me talk and put words in your direction. So I'm going to be re relying pretty, pretty heavily on my notes today, because if I don't, I'm going to go off the rails and turn this into a 45-minute talk, and we don't want that. So I was asked to talk today about iOS user experience and how we got here and where we're going. Well, truthfully, I was asked to talk about my blog, Skew It, and give examples of people doing stupid things in user interface design. But I don't really want to do that. I want to talk about important things with you. Everything has already been said, but since nobody listens, it's necessary for us to say it all over again. This conference is about iOS, but to say that there's a divergence in design style is a new era is to ignore history. You see, the great thing about the simple questions, how did we get here and where are we going, is if we pay attention to history, we can find our answers. How? How can we find this way? Well, path dependence. Path dependence is where we are going, determined by where we're coming from. And we're going to talk about that today. It's in its simplest form. The path dependence determines that where we're going is determined by where we're coming from. So how did we get here? Well, looking back, it appears to me that there are two major phases of iOS development. First was just being there, establishing your existence. I was part of this first phase in building Mint's iPhone app. Our purpose was to meet an existing audience where they wanted us, on a device that they just likely purchased and barely knew how to use. We used mostly standard interface builder components and adhered diligently to the human interface guidelines because every Apple app fit the mold and there was no reason to create friction in this new experience. In fact, the apps that did at the time, those who chose to do something new, were ridiculed for being clumsy and often rejected by Apple. So I suppose in this way, it was Apple enforcing path dependence, going from an old context to the new, and enforcing the path dependence on human interface guidelines. But it served the right purpose. So the second phase, where we are now, is in serving the best purpose for the target audience in a very crowded market. And that's about being best in class. 
So what does that even mean? How do we know what best is? And what class, the context, are, even, are, we, are we even talking about? Well, that's a lot harder. But we can reverse engineer the decisions of the apps we use and not just try to understand their intent or say that they look stale or look good and they look dated or don't, but we can try to approximate the problems they were solving and see if those problems are still relevant in what we're building today. See, when we build something with explicit purpose, meaning we're designing, not doing art, our audience receives it and interprets its relevance on a spectrum of functional to experiential. And in trying to be the best fit for that audience, we have our estimation of where that is, and the audience has their estimation of where it should be. And so our goal in building and designing for them is to minimize the delta between those two points. Okay, so this is all basic, right? We say, sure, good design serves a purpose and does it efficiently with the least friction. But that friction comes from what we think of as a mismatch, a functional mismatch, when our expectations as a user do not match the interface we encounter. So how do we reduce that friction? Well, there's all this garbage in iOS design talk right now about how flat interfaces just get out of the way or how skeuomorphism is tacky. This is the era of good design, minimalism. But this is just all a completely made up conflict by tech pundits and outspoken people trying to engage their Twitter followers. See, this is not about flat design. This is not about skeuomorphism. It's about understanding the role of path dependence in user interface design both as it pertains to bringing existing concepts to a new context, like books to a tablet, or, and as it pertains to the future decisions we make for continuing applications on those platforms. So we find ourselves now in this important conversation as designers, and it's very exciting. We're being present for the, most, the first major stylistic divergence on our new platform. But we can learn from the past instead of holding these dogmatic, hyperbolic views and simply parroting the arbitrary decisions of others, or arbitrarily parroting those decisions of others, because that's what got us in this whole realism mess and, and, and discussion in the first place. So why did we have such a strong presence of visual path dependence in iOS app design? Because we had a major context shift from the physical to the virtual, and we needed to take users along for the ride and reduce friction in touching a tablet. So reducing that experiential, experiential mismatch, if you will. But this has happened before, and we can learn from it. One of the most relevant era, eras of interface virtualization is that of audio production. In the late 1980s, it became clear that the capabilities of digital multi-tracking would disrupt the music industry. Early interfaces on desktops, very simple systems, attempted to minimize friction, friction in context switching by maintaining path dependence, recreating the physical interface that these audio engineers were accustomed to with system components. So this was a functional match, benefiting from the user's spatial memory and knowledge of these, the convoluted visual language of the hardware. Many of these people had never even used a computer before and still didn't have them in their homes, but were comfortable enough using this new interface to continue making a living using it. So fast forward 10 years. 50% of homes have computers now. 10% of homes are making music on those computers in their homes. But the interfaces had not matured. They were still meant for composition and production based on the same decisions that we saw 10 years ago. They were dependent on the path set for them. They were rolling in new features slowly, but still carrying the old paradigms and still serving the same audience they did in 1991. So along comes reason. It targeted that audience to say, this product is not like the others. That thing that you're using for making music isn't making music. It was for audio engineers. That $2,000 drum machine that you were about to go buy, you don't need to buy that anymore because we'll give you 10 of them for $300. And they rebelled with even more detail. They threw the pendulum back towards the experiential. And even though we didn't have multi-touch interfaces at the time, the cable elements had a physical response to mouse input. And so for anyone who had, had used this 10 years ago, um, this was amazing. The, these cables would swing around as you moved one jack to another. And it really felt like you had a virtual studio inside your computer. It enticed people to play, rewire, and truly interact with software as if it was a fully experiential virtual studio. So at the same time, a community had been growing around tools that shed complete ties to the physical studio, maintaining no dependence on hardware, drum machines, or any knowledge of, this, of the existing technology and it focused on sampling and digital audio. 
So with no need to maintain aesthetic path dependency, we have our first major path divergence. So if path dependent interfaces are those that take direction from the interfaces before them, divergence means breaking ties and creating new deliberate decisions in contrast. This is also called path independence in economics, but I like using divergence here because it speaks to the action, not the state. So Ableton Live in 2001 adopted a completely flat UI to make a bold statement that you were not supposed to enjoy the experience of interacting with your computer's interface. You were supposed to enjoy interacting with your instruments and the content that you created with them. Your computer was there to be the brain, the organizer, and the recorder. They even went so far as to let you customize the entire color scheme of this so the visual design of the applica application did not distract you from your goals as a creative musician. So while you might think that this sealed the trend of flat interfaces in audio software, a decade later, we now have maturity and diversity. Some choose functional minimalism. Well, we could say, hey, this is super clean. These guys must have the right idea, right? No, because this was designed with purpose to balance function with experience, letting a very simple interface belie extremely powerful, unexpected quality greater than that of its extremely visually complex peers. And it shined through with much delight to the industry. So, so we say, OK, it's divergence. Do we always have to stand out against the crowd? Is that the answer? No, because purposeless, arbitrary divergence is not the answer either. Because at the same time, currently on the market, this software here, still one of the best in its class, has its, an interface meticulously detailed in Photoshop that's not a photograph. And it's to not just match the interface of an Ampex ATR-102 mastering tape recorder. It's to match the exact interface of the actual refrigerator-sized unit in the workshop of the company that they use to model the effect. And it has even the scratches, the same remnants of scotch tape from splicing on it. And it remains experiential in that what they're trying to do is convince us to believe everything here has purpose and function and convey the same attention to detail to the interface that they did in engineering the product itself. Now understand, to buy the real, the real world counterpart of this would cost around $5,000, with about $1,000 a year in upkeep, if you could even find one on eBay. And now it's running off a USB key for $300. So it's critical that the experience here convinces those who've used the real ones and know how it should behave. So just like we're seeing in iOS, in a market saturated with irresponsible realism and a hypersensitive response to it, those focusing on matching the expectations of the user have shined through. Well, you might say, hey, that's a reel-to-reel. -reel. So that's OK. I can use a reel-to-reel -reel in my applications. Well, where have I seen that before in user interface design? Why? In Apple's podcasts. So what's the purpose here? Well, we can only assume the purpose here is to show off the visual design talent of the team that made it. Or say, hey, look, everybody, Dieter Rams. Or that I can tape ghosts in my basement with my iPad. I don't know. But the majority of people have no emotional response to this interface whatsoever. It maintains path dependency on a device that its audience hasn't just shed dependence. They probably never even encountered it. It suggests that I, who actually have used a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder in college, should expect functions and qualities I know to exist on a reel-to-reel, -reel, like record, which is not true, and entices me to touch things that do nothing. This is why we have discussed for this type of interface and think that this is not a trend we should follow, because there's an experiential mismatch here. It's a mismatch of expectation, neither serving an experiential nor functional purpose to us. But in contrast, what does a match look like? What's a good match for us? Well, it looks like this. This is so functional that it doesn't even have a rewind button because you likely don't need to rewind a podcast. You're just bored and want to skip to the next one. And in the same class, we could go fully experiential. And it looks like this. It's a bonkers drop shadow world interface that communicates the personality of the podcast it contains, independent of any path, even Apple's human interface guidelines. And its, its purpose is to emotionally connect conceptually and delight the user with the same esoteric creativity that we've come to expect from the content within it. OK, so we return to purpose. What is the purpose of our design, and who does it serve? Well, just like Pro Tools made computers more familiar to audio engineers, Apple did the same for the general public with iBooks. What's the purpose here? To communicate the 
the entire experience in a screenshot. It made the Kindle look like a calculator. Apple didn't have to win over other Kindle users. They had to win over people who believed they did not need an iPad. This single screenshot communicated the power and the friendliness of the device, not just for book readers, but for everyone. It represented transformation of a device. Everyone knew how to use iBooks just by looking at this. And they, even then, they, they knew how to use the iPad just by looking at this. This was path dependent, but dependent on a physical artifact that had never existed in digital form this way. And just like we saw in musical interfaces 20 years ago, people started stealing the design, but not the thinking behind the design. And they were stealing the design, stealing the page curls and the corners, but they weren't stealing the reasons behind those. And who of all people stole the, the design without stealing the thinking behind it? Why was that dirty, no good Apple? Just like podcasts, we have a complete functional experiential mismatch. Path dependency on visual and interactive artifacts that the audience just didn't expect from this. And unlike podcasts, which at least attempted to make the interface conceptually cohesive, Apple just slapped a bunch of buttons and a scroll bar on a piece of paper instead of accepting that the functions that users already expected in a digital address book, those present in the plain, unexciting, functional one that existed before, dictated a path for the interface independent of ties to a physical analog anymore. So how does one take meaningful cues from an existing product with a large audience overlap, but diverge from dependence on unnecessary, irrelevant visual artifacts? As Flipboard showed, they could capitalize on the path dependency of the interface paradigm of paging, but their assumption was that users who owned the device would already understand how to navigate their UI after learning their way around Apple's iBooks. So now, when we ask why about all these divergent decisions Flipboard made in context, we have a better approximation of the answers. And similarly, when we decide to put a product on the market and expect users to make a large conceptual leap to do something as simple as remember to pick up milk, we have to question whether or not we're making the right decision for that user base. And so the point that I want to leave you with is this. Path dependency is a guiding force in interface design. And understanding its relevance helps us know what's appropriate for our users and what isn't. We've been here before and we'll be here again. But where we go is a response to where we're coming from now, making deliberate functional and experiential design decisions that make the most impact on our intended audience. The end. <laughs> Here's the day for electronic snack foods here. Let's go on mirror one. All right, so my name is Michael Griffith. I'm uh, the creative director with Bottle Rocket. And so actually yesterday, you guys probably saw Calvin up here. Uh, Calvin and I are, are, are both rocketeers at, at Bottle Rocket. So um, as soon as we're up and he running here, here we go. All right. So. Uh, my approach to this uh, past, present, future thing and, and user uh, experience is, is kind of taking a look at the past and seeing if we can recognize if there's any like uh, absolute truths around user experience that kind of can guide us into the future. And so I thought I'd do this through uh, rock and roll. So um, rock and roll is a little bit of a, a passion of mine as, long as, as well with design. So uh, this seems to make sense. Hopefully it'll make sense to you. Um, Looking at the history of rock and roll, this is uh, uh, Robert Johnson in 1929. Supposedly, he went to the crossroads and sold his soul to the devil uh, to be a, an awesome guitar player. And uh, so thereby he, there, thereby, he defined the very first absolute truth of rock and roll, which, me, which was music, uh, this rock and roll music is of the devil. And so um, the next thing that happened was this guy, Les Paul. He invented the uh, electric guitar. And uh, with inventing the electric guitar, he kind of defined the next absolute truth about rock and roll, which is play it loud. And so these are the things that are going to be sort of success criteria if you want to form a rock and roll band or you want to uh, uh, be a rock and roll star one day. So um, 
Next came along, ignore that guy in the upper left, we'll talk about him in a second, but this, is, oh, this guy over here is Sam Phillips, and um, he defined the, the, the third absolute truth of rock and roll, that it's really about making money, because he set up a label where he could sell these guys and, and, and make an incredible amount of money, which was uh, Sun Records. So then this guy comes along, Elvis, and uh, the, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard the story, he, uh, uh, when he was, uh, what, what television show was it? What did he... Ed Sullivan. So, yeah, when he uh, made the appearance there, they kept the camera above his waist because there was just too much movement going on below his waist, which let us know that sex is a big part of rock and roll. And then these guys came along, and it was more than just these guys. It was the whole British invasion. And so the Beatles came along, and then the Who, and then uh, the Animals, and a bunch of other British bands, Yardbirds, Donovan, uh, the Trogs. And really what this was about, this was crazy because... We invented rock and roll here, and they stole it, and they did it better than us. And so that kind of let us know that, you know, rock and roll has always been about a ripoff, whether it's, you know, selling it to consumers or uh, ripping off the, the people that came before you. So then this guy came along and stole it back. Uh, if you're not familiar with Iggy Pop, he would, uh, uh, he, he has quite a reputation. He, he actually would, like, smear his body in peanut butter and roll in broken glass, and he invented this stage dive. And so, to me, he's kind of the grandfather of, of punk music. Um, but why, where would those behaviors come from? Drugs. And so, drugs is now uh, probably a big part of rock and roll, unfortunately. And then these guys came along, and these guys broke the bank. And uh, I don't know if you saw Jamie up here. She was wearing a shirt, uh, a Sex Pistols T-shirt earlier, so I was silently cheering her on from the corner when I saw that. Um, these guys uh, really broke the bank when it came to all these, um, these absolute truths of rock and roll. So they just mixed it all together. Sex, angst, drugs, rebellion, money, ripoff, hedonism, and hair. And this is where you started to see the hair go crazy. And so, you know, this is all fine and good. But along the way, the things I didn't talk about is when rock and roll really got off track. And uh, uh, soon after these guys happened, you know, it started to go off track again. And what happens when you start to stray from these absolute truths? Well, this, well these, are, this is, uh, these, are, these are the Sex Pistols, Johnny Lydon and Sid Vicious. And you can see the hair they're sporting. And, and that was, you know, brand new at the time. But unfortunately, this guy came along, Flock of Seagulls, and he screwed up that haircut. And then that took another step to Michael Bolton, who invented this, uh, what do we call this? Uh, the long and back mullet. mullet. So the mullet happened, and then the most horrible thing happened. Um, this band, Starship, actually from this city, had three mullets in it, which caused them to create this song, uh, We Built This City on Rock and Roll, which is the absolute worst rock and roll song ever. And so this is where it all went really, really wrong, because they weren't paying attention to what really made rock and roll made rock and roll. So let's think about that with user experience. Um, and just to show how user experience can go off, or not so much user experience, but how even Apple can goof up, this is the, they call it the Molar Mac. And bonus points for anyone can s tell me what year this came out. If you're a real Apple fan, you would know this. Nine <laughs> this was 98. And they called it, I, I would call it the iMolar, I guess, but it's the Molar Mac. This uh, was right before the iMac, and you can see the top of it and how it's shaped. It's a really bizarre shape. This thing weighed 60 pounds. It was ridiculous, and uh, it was only actually released in, uh, like, schools for education and colleges and things. So um, they got off the rails and, and, and left behind those absolute truths of design when they, when they built this, and it was a magnificent failure. But back to rock and roll. The good thing is uh, Starship screwed up, and these guys saved rock and roll because they returned to those things that I was talking about, those absolute truths. And then it started to stray. You know, rap turned into models doing rap, which turned into models singing and winning Grammys that they weren't even singing. So um, again, to get back on track, these guys came along. And they did an awesome job. And, uh, 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 and, and I think kind of, I don't know, of course, I'm older, and so this is the last, like, you know, they kind of invented some other aspects of rock and roll. I haven't seen anyone really rock like these guys rocked, and some things have gone wrong since then, you know, to get to today. A bunch of stuff happened after these guys, and here's where we're at today. And this is, like, so far off the tracks that we really need to return to these things. So 
if you do these things, if you, if you adhere to this, you can be a rock star. And unfortunately, James Dempsey, you, there's nothing in here about data modeling, and so I think you've kind of capped your career as a rock star. But uh, if, you, you know, if you want to get back on trap, realize it's the devil's music, it's for outsiders, it's a ripoff, it's the start of a rebellion, it's hedonistic, it's fueled by sex, angst, money, drugs, and it will likely change your hair, and it's really loud. If you adhere to those, you're going to be a rock star. So what, how can you be a user experience star? Um, let's review kind of a brief history of user experience. So you've probably seen this before, um, the first Apple computer. And what's weird, I looked at this this morning. I, I've never noticed it. That thing up in the corner is actually an outlet, plugs. And I'm like thinking, Apple, if they're holding back, if they invented a machine that you could plug it into itself for power, that's awesome. <laughs> but I don't know what those are for. Anyway, so they invented this, and you guys know this story. So a bunch of stuff happened. You stood in line, you got an iPad, and we redefined user experience in a lot of ways. So here's the iPad that you walked out of the store with, and probably one of the very first apps you put on it was this one, which made you realize, I can build apps better than that. <laughs> and I, I shouldn't pick on this too much. So this was actually an awesome app to, to demonstrate the hardware and what the hardware and software could do. From a usability perspective, Oh, never mind. So what are the absolute truths of user experience now that we've reviewed the history of user experience? Um, I'm going to relate it to rock and roll because that's what I understand. So know your target. Uh, this is Art Chantry. Uh, he designed gig posters um, for a lot of punk bands and punk shows. And I saw him talk once, and he said something that has totally stuck with me. He called it advertising through exclusion, which really what he's talking about was doing things to appeal to a very small audience and don't worry about everyone else. If everyone else wants on board, that's great. But here's an example of what he would do. So this, this band is The Cramps, one of my favorite bands, but a band I would not take my mother to. And so when you saw so Art Chantry actually designed this gig poster, and it's hard to read. You know, the readability is awful. It's, it's very specific. When this is hanging on a, when it's duct taped to a, a, a lamp post or something and you walk by this, you have to walk up to it and really look at it and read it to know what time the show is, where the bands are playing, what bands are going to be playing and, and, and what bands are there and all that stuff. You can't just see it from a distance and know and show up at the show. That's designed that way on purpose. My mother would never walk up to the lamp post and read this. They don't, we don't want my mother at this show. And so, but people who, like me, who are looking for these interesting things would actually go up there and digest the whole thing. So in design, can you start taking those things and applying those things to building apps? Um, so I'm going to show some examples. Uh, I'll, I'll try to identify which ones we've done as a bottle rocket and which ones we haven't. We did not do this one, but this is a Turntable FM. Turntable FM knows their user. If you've used this app, uh, you know, it's, if you're a music fan, what, what, what a music fan really want? You want free music? You want to be able to share it. You want people to recognize that you're turning them on to new music, so you, you credential those people that are showing new music. Um, they've really grabbed onto it, and they've, they've got this whole rating system, so you're a DJ up there, and you're getting thumbs up and thumbs down. They knew their audience, and what's interesting is it expanded outside of that audience as it grew, but it started with a really deep understanding of what makes music fans tick. Another absolute truth of user experience that I feel we should take advantage of is build things that are unique and ownable. And so when I'm talking about that, this is Tom Waits. Everybody knows Tom Waits, right? He's incredible. He, uh, I, can, I don't even know how to describe his music. Um, it doesn't fit into any one genre. And I think that's amazing. And so the, his wife once said uh, that he makes two kinds of music, Grand Weepers and Grim Reapers. And if you know Tom Waits, that's, that's pretty accurate. That's about the best description you could give of his music. If anyone else tries to sound like Tom Waits, they get called out for trying to sound like him. He has created something that's extremely unique and extremely ownable. And so, you know, how does that get applied to an app? We did not do Flipboard either, but uh, Flipboard, that, that folding thing that goes on, that's magic. And everyone's trying to steal it, and every time someone steals it, they get called out on it and said, oh, you're just using the Flipboard fold, you know? That's amazing that you can create an, a, a, a unique and ownable thing on basically what we just used to think of as a transition. You know, um, it's attention to those details that makes a huge difference. Change the way somebody, someone thinks about something. Um, you know, obviously Apple is is fantastic at this, but another guy that was pretty good at it was Andy Warhol. 
Uh, and so Andy Warhol has a great quote. Once you got pop, you could never see a sign again in the same way. And once you thought pop, you could never see America the same way again. Um, kind of a weird quote, but if you think about it, it is pretty amazing because he redefined how we think what we think art is. He also redefined what we think music is, or at least he tried. This, this band is uh, the Velvet Underground, which pretty much everybody agrees was awful, but, and most of their records were bought by themselves, but, <laughs> but it was an attempt. And, um, and, and he did change the way people thought about music, and they influenced a lot of other bands moving forward. And so thinking about that, how can you present things in a different way? And I know this isn't necessarily UI-based or UX-based, but it's, it's more content-based. But I think it's a great example. This is the, uh, the Civil War app that Bottle Rocket did. And, and one of the, the greatest pieces or parts of this is this, this chunk here where uh, a day in the life. And so I can, I can selectively, so I should back up and say, every day uh, content is released as if you're in that day of the Civil War back in time. So uh, you, can be, you can read about a day in the life of civil or uh, Abraham Lincoln, which you probably saw in textbooks to some extent, but you can also be, read or dive into the day, a day in the life of a soldier's wife who's, uh, whose husband has gone off to war. What a really unique and different perspective. And how would you change the way someone thinks about the Civil War? Present it in those terms. Another absolute truth of user experience. Build a focused and guided experience. And I actually think that this is, you know, remember Ken yesterday talking about simplicity? This is the same difference. So one of my other favorite bands, Devo, and uh, one of my favorite Devo quotes, freedom of choice is what you've got. Freedom from choice is what you want. Um, sounds weird, but think about that. When you're presented with a million choices, you can't make a choice. When you're presented with fewer, and he gave the example of you know the four models of Apple versus the uh, uh, 50 sum of Dell, I think it was. You know, uh, uh, I think this is a really important point. And so, how does that translate to an app? I don't think that the TED app is a beautiful app or, or, or amazing uh, as, as a user experience, but there's one element that's absolutely amazing, and it's the Inspire Me button. And if you do that, you guys can barely see this. It says you, uh, you want something, and that list on the left is uh, adjectives. And we're talking about how important words are and, and just single words or, or a few words. These words are all kind of branded words, like do you want to see something fascinating? Beautiful. Those aren't the normal words. You know, usually you, you have categories like, do you want to see something fiction, nonfiction? These are words that actually start to define what you want to see. And then it says, and, how, and then the next screen asks you how much time you have. Really, if you think about this, that is just a search engine. That's all it's doing is it's matching those those tags to this thing. Instead of returning the results in a big list, it returns it. Here's only three videos. We know there's probably a billion videos that actually fit that description but it just gave me three. It feels finite, it feels great, and, uh, and, 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 and the one that, you know, it, it feels like it's curated and special, and it is. It's just thought of in a different way. But again, it's not much more than a search, right? Another absolute truth of, of user experience, uh, I'm gonna pick on Led Zeppelin for this one, but create something immediately familiar. Um, this gets me in trouble sometimes. I think Led Zeppelin was the greatest cover band to ever live. And that's, that's really a pretty good compliment, but they probably wouldn't want to hear that, and they don't fess up to it. But if you really look at their lyrics and a lot of what they did, it, uh, they took it somewhere else, but it's stolen. And uh, uh, where was I going? Oh, so um, building something familiar. So this is, uh, we did build this. This is part of the 106 and Park app. Uh, 106 and Park is a show where you actually vote on the top 10 videos of the day. Well, what's the easiest way to do voting? Probably put together a, a list view and just tap on the one that you want to uh, vote for. And what we did was, you know what, let's make it a, a record scratch. And so it's, my votes are actually how many times I can scratch the record, like back and forth in four seconds, I think it is. So um, this is, we presented it though on a turntable. And when you see this, you immediately want to, you want to touch that record player. You've been presented with something that you know to do something completely new and different, and you're immediately engaged. Um, this was uh, so much fun. Oh, and this last one shows how like the, the yellow's creeping up behind it. That's how many scratches, so that's going up while you're scratching. Um, you know, this, uh, this was so much fun that uh, they actually uh, have kids come up on the stage at 106 and Park and actually compete with each other to, to um, uh, see who can get the most votes. All right. 
So uh, really quickly, let the user define the app. Um, this is the Ramones. The Ramones, uh, those are the Chuck Taylor Converse tennis shoes. They didn't define, obviously those were basketball shoes, probably the worst basketball shoes ever invented, but the punks started wearing them. And then the cheerleaders started wearing them, and the nerds started wearing them, and they totally embraced it. They didn't say, you can't wear those because you're not a basketball player. Think about that with apps. How do you make that happen with apps? Pinterest, and I'll be embarrassed to admit, I'm a guy and I have a Pinterest account. But you can use this for whatever you want. It's up to you to define the use and, and what it's for. And so, you know, whether I just want to document the beers I drank at South by Southwest or I want to collect pictures of wedding gowns, I can do either one in that app. That's cool. Um, the app is the device, and so Rick Wakeman is an amazing keyboard player, but his career was capped by the fact that he was trying to turn a guitar into a keyboard, and this whole keyboard, thing, that's, that's not rock and roll. And so, because it got abstracted, the keyboard just doesn't work that way. And so, you know, thinking about an app that, uh, that, 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 that works and that, that, that becomes the device, or the device becomes what it is, is, um, what is this, Scorekeeper? If you've seen it, so I can add my name to it. Uh, I can add other people's names to it. And I can, all I can do is just keep score. That's all it does. But it doesn't tell me how to do it or what it, I can define it myself. And it's, it, uh, it, it, the, the whole thing now becomes a scoreboard. So you can see I'm winning. Nipsey Russell is in second place. And the bad news is that Iggy Pop is beating your mom. Uh, personal device assumes personal relevance. And so just like mixtapes you would make for your girlfriend, they didn't make sense to anyone else, but they made sense to your girlfriend. Build apps that way. So, uh, you know, this is my phone when I first bought it. This is my phone two minutes later. I take a picture of my cat and I use it on the screen. It's my phone. It lives in my pocket. Everything on it should be about me and for me. Here's examples. You know, I've got pictures of weird things I do to my cat. I've got pictures of my doodles. I've got pictures of where I parked my car. Those are very personal things. Apps can do the same thing. So, you know, Flipboard does a great job of pulling personal relevance into, you know, the, the, the screens there. Apps are about the here and now. So, you know, the web is where everything lives forever and ever. And if you want to sort through all that stuff, that's great. But just like Madonna, who reinvented herself every day and she was about the moment, it's the same thing. I feel like it's the same thing with apps. And a, a great example of that is Entertainment Weekly. They only give, this is only published once a week, and it's only 10 things, and it's their 10 things, and then I have to wait till next Sunday for the next batch of 10 things. I can't search through it. I can't go through the whole archive. I can back up to last week's or go to the week previous, but I can't jump back to a specific date. That's okay. That's a cool experience. That's what makes it way different than a website. All right, so if you're going to form a UEX band and you want success, these are the things that you just need to do. If you do these things, it's going to be successful. Um, I've worded them a little differently there, but it's the same difference. Uh, and so that makes me think about the future, and it's impossible to predict what the future is. I would say, if you adhere to these, you don't even need to worry about what the future is and where things are going. Um, if you apply these, basically, to get back to rock and roll, do you guys know where this came from? Spinal Tap? So this is an amplifier that goes up to 11 <laughs> rather than 10, so it's louder than the amp that goes to 10. And I think that's what the future is kind of about, is uh-oh, there we go. Uh, you know, the future is no different. It's just louder. Just take those principles I talked about and blow them out further and further. Make an app that's more personally relevant than the app you made last week. Um, take all those things and just push them further. And I think that's what the future is all about. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. And I apologize because I messed up the technology stuff up here. We don't have any time for questions. We, let's take about five minutes, and then we'll come back for the next presentation at 3.05. Thanks again.